Hi, my name is Paul Gibson. I'm an architect here at Blackbot, and today I'm going to be presenting uh, behind the scenes of a Sky API request journey. Um, this presentation is inspired by a TV show you might have seen on cable on the Discovery Channel, or maybe it's on um, uh, Sci Fi Channel, a sci uh, science channel. And it's called How It's Made, and they always take you behind the scenes of manufacturing some device or some food or something like that, like a clock radio or a candy cane or something. And personally, I always find it fascinating to watch this show and see what goes on behind the scenes in, in everyday ordinary things that I use or consume. And so I thought it might be interesting to share with this audience a similar view of behind the scenes of what happens when you make a Sky API request from your Sky application uh, into our API services. Um, so I thought the way we could go through this is to really just go behind the scenes and show you how it's made and, and uh, trace an actual request as it moves through various layers in the software. And it turns out it's quite a complex process. So after we see how it's made, we're going to drill in and say, you know what, this is not really how it's made. This is how it's made. Because you see, we, we build upon abstraction on top of abstraction on top of abstraction to try and keep things simple. And so as we go through this presentation today, you're going to see more and more increasing complexity. Now, um, because it's going to be so complex, I did create a few uh, little indicators or um, characters um, that will help us keep track of what's going on. So just like on the TV show, how it's made, they give you a little preview of what's to come. I want to show a little bit of what you're going to see today. And you can do you want to stick with it or change over and watch uh, some other show. So we're going to learn about something called the Azure Proxy. I bet a lot of people have heard about this before because every now and then we do talk about it. We're talking about what happens with Sky API. You're also going to hear about something called the Azure Traffic Manager. You're going to learn about a sassy little component called SAS, stands for Service Authorization Service. You're going to learn about something called Pods. We're going to visit our WAF our web application firewall. We're going to talk about SCS is another acronym. This, there's going to be tons of acronyms here. SCS stands for self-contained system, and we'll get into that. If you got pod, you got to have pod lookup. So we'll be talking about pod lookup. And then, of course, we're going to talk about tenant mapping because at the end of the day, we are a SaaS provider with multiple tenants in the infrastructure. And so there's a process to look up tenants, which we'll talk about. Now, as I said, this uh, machinery that, that kicks in when you make a Sky API call is quite complex. And I think when I built this presentation, I said, you know, it's either Rube Goldberg or a, a beautiful piece of architecture. Uh, you can be the judge of that. Um, I will say there's so much complexity here that even I don't understand all the moving parts. So what I'll talk about will be the components that I understand using the abstractions I know. Probably someone could come along behind me and say, actually, Paul, that's not how I made it all. And they would drill into some component that I treat as a black box and they would tell me how that really works. And that's kind of the beauty of software development, in my opinion, is that we create these abstractions which make very complicated things appear simple to certain consumers who only need that simple view. So that's what we'll be walking through. At the end, hopefully you'll appreciate maybe there's some beauty and elegance in the complexity and how at the end of the day, it is a pretty simple thing to use as a Sky API developer. So the actual API trace, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to pick one API. I'm going to use an API from the Razor's Edge NXT constituent API. Now, you could everything I talk about applies to all the Sky API products that are out there. So Financial Edge, uh, Education, Payment Services, even the new Blackboard CRM and all, for, all true APIs, all of those use the same infrastructure. And much of what I talk about will be applicable to them as well. Um, but for the example, I'm most familiar with Razor's Edge, and Razor's Edge has some of the more interesting things that get um, that are going on once you get past the first part of, of the machinery. So I think it'll be interesting to uh, review that. Um, so this is the API we're going to call. It's the simple constituent get. Um, we demo this all the time. You can see that uh, you know the API is there: HTTPS, API, Sky, Black, Black, Black Comms, WAC constituent, WAC V1, WAC constituents, and the 280, which is the record identifier. And what's important about that URL is there are some important parts that come into play when you make an API call. Of course, there's the host name API at Sky, Black, 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 which is 
how the internet's going to route your call. Then there's the portion of that string, which we call the route, which is really, once it gets to our world, how are we going to route it? <laughs> and then, of course, embedded will be HTTP headers that will contain your authorization jot as well as your subscription key. Um, and I'm going to skip past the part where you get an auth token, because many apps would have done that already. I'm going to start from the perspective of you've already got your auth token, you know how to craft the headers, and you're just going to send this. I'm going to trace this call. So the nice thing about Sky PI is it's a pretty simple abstraction. Uh, I've, I've depicted a Sky application on the left. This would be if you're a Sky developer, partner, customer, calling the Sky PI from your application. That's the black box on the left. And you use the URL, you use your favorite REST client, could be you know, .NET code, Java code, C Sharp, could be Python, could be anything. Any HTTP client, could be PowerShell, could be curl. Any uh, HTTP client is able to call this API using standard you know, REST protocol through the cloud. And that is a view that works. If that's your mental model of how everything works, you're set. You don't need to know anything else. And this presentation today won't help you do anything you can't do with this mental model. It won't make you a better coder. It won't help you troubleshoot. Um, it's just interesting, in my opinion. And so we're going to drill in and see a little more complex view of what really happens here. Now, if you're cool with this, if you like this view, you want to be at peace and an understanding of this, then by all means, get out of here. This is this is a great view. This is the model. This is what you will observe working. But um, if you're willing to get a little bit deeper in the weeds uh, and maybe give up some of your peaceful this um, with a simple view, then stick with it and we'll go through some of the complexities. So now I think most people probably in their head would say, well, yeah, I know it's not that simple because at the end of the day, I know you have a database. Like I know that about Blackbot. I know it, you know, we used to run on premise and you always have had a SQL database. So I know there's a database behind the scenes. So first sort of more complex view is yes, behind the scenes when the application calls the API, the API turns around and uses, not REST, but uses the tabular data stream or TDS protocol to access the database. So, okay, a little bit more complex, but also I think this is well understood. Um, but what might not be understood is there's many, many more proving parts than even this. So the first clue would be, if we look at that host name, api.sky.blackbot.com, if you use the NS lookup command line tool, which is a way to look up what is the IP address for a given host name, then you get an interesting answer. We can see here that the answer for the name that corresponds to api.sky.blackbot.com is a very long API MGTH blah blah blah, blah dot cloud up dot net. And if you look that up, you find out that Microsoft owns cloud up dot net. And you might think, well, that's okay. I know that I know that my, uh, Blackboard runs in the Azure data centers, so that makes sense to go to Microsoft. But even if you're accessing the uh, education product, um, those happen to run in AWS. If you're accessing payments, some of that runs in AWS. Some things run in Ecolo. All of them are going to start with this cloudop.net name and IP address. And the clue of what's going on here is the start. It says API MGMTH. This is where we get to our first character. So it turns out between every Sky application and every Blackbaud API, there is something called the Azure API proxy. Um, this proxy is hosted by Microsoft. You know, we don't document that this is in the mix and we would be um, possibly changing vendors at some time, um, but we like, we like Microsoft right now, so we use them. And through the magic of DNS, um, all of your calls route through this. Now what the proxy does is, it's sort of like our first um, gate. It kind of is like a little security guard at the front front desk. And it makes sure that the embedded jot that's in the header is valid. Makes sure, so in other words, that your OAuth jot is valid. Um, it makes sure it can do things like throttling. So if you make too many calls per second, the dreaded throttle, that's all enforced in this layer. Also make sure that you have a valid subscription key. Um, so you can't even access our back end if you don't already have a Sky Developer account with a valid subscription key. And it also handles routing to the destination API. Because as I said, all of the um, Sky APIs 
uh, go through this layer. So whether you're calling the K-12 education stuff, payment stuff, all true CRM, et cetera, uh, financial edge, they all go through this and routing is one of the services it provides. So that's our first character. That's the first level of complexity. Um, now it turns out that it's actually even more complex than this um, because we don't just have one proxy. We actually have two because um, for regional purposes and performance, we would like to route you to the first proxy in your region uh, that's closest. So for example, we have one proxy in the US North American region and we have another one in Asia PAC. And because we have two proxies, it begs the question, how do I know which one to go to? Well, that's where traffic manager comes into play. So traffic manager is a service from Azure that basically does DNS magic. When you ask for that host name, api.com, it says, okay, well, based on where this DNS query is coming from, I know you're coming from maybe the Asia PAC region. And so I will serve you up the IP address for the Asia PAC proxy. Or if you come from North American region or another region that's closer, it'll serve up the USA. Of course, all that is fault tolerant. If one of those was having an issue, you would also go to the other one, might be a little slower, but that's where it would go. So starting to get more complex, um, a few more layers in the stack here. And that leads us to the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, before we can drill into the next layer of complexity, we have to understand one fundamental thing. Um, there's a thing we talk about a black belt called a self-contained system or SCS. Now we didn't invent this. This is somewhat industry standard. It's been around for probably like 10 years, kind of came about in the same era of microservices, if you've heard that terminology. What a self-contained system is, it's a domain area that is loosely coupled from other things, and it's comprised of various internal services and data stores that are abstracted behind really well-defined interfaces. We talk about SCSs as though they're singular things, like we treat them like almost nouns. Um, and we have specific engineering teams would own a specific SCS, so the SCS whatever is owned by this team, a different SCS is owned by a different team. And what it means to own means they're responsible for creating it in the first place, uh, monitoring it, making sure it's meeting all of our non-functional requirements, that it has high availability. If alerts go off that are, set, that are part of that self-contained system, uh, then the teams that owns them are the ones who respond to those alerts. It's just a logical way to organize a whole bunch of parts that work together as a system. And a key point is, they themselves are sort of black box components that are built from a variety of tech stacks. So we have SCSs that are built in um, .NET, C Sharp code. We have SCSs, many other services are built in Java and some other diverse tools and te technologies that are in these SCSs. The beauty of the concept is as a consumer, as, as somebody who interacts with these SCSs, I don't have to know what's going on inside those things because as I said, we always interface with them in uh, standard, well-defined interfaces that are sort of tech stack agnostic. So now that you know what a self-contained system is, let's talk about one specific self-contained system. This is the Ser Service Authorization Service, SCS. And what this service does, what this SCS does, it's a database that keeps track of what services and SCSs are allowed to call other services. Uh, as you will see, we're going to have a lot of services talking to each other in this whole ecosystem. And we want to obviously enforce that only the right service can call the other service. Now, in the old days, say maybe 20 years ago in IT, you would sort of, if you had things that were within your own network, you might do what's called any any, like, hey, just everything on the network can call each other. And we rely on the fact that we've got a firewall. And once you get into our network, um, you know, anyone can call anything. That's not the really the contemporary view. The contemporary view is what you call zero trust, where we want to make sure if we're getting a call, even if it's coming from within the house, we want to have some validation there. And so that's what the sort of this authorization service CS does. Um, the service itself is accessed via REST. So again, standard protocols, and it does some logging as well. So we also have the ability to track that this service was granted access to this other service and on this day actually utilize that access. I've depicted this as a little handy robot. He's got a little ticket meter there because he sort of like passes out tickets uh, for other services, which we'll see next. So what this means is that service authorization service is actually needed for the proxy to call into the constituent API. Because again, while the proc the Azure proxy is going to validate the jots are okay, 
we need to know that it's actually the Azure proxy calling us in our API. And so the way we do that is with the SaaS system. So what happens is when a call comes in to the proxy, the proxy will make a call to SaaS to obtain a, t a ticket. It'll prove itself to SaaS because in the SaaS database will be uh, a record that says, yes, we've authorized the Azure proxy to call the constituent API. It'll call into SaaS to get a ticket. SaaS will validate that that's the case and thus issue a ticket back to the proxy. And the proxy will turn around and call the constituent API. Yep, that sounds a little confusing. Um, you say it again. The SaaS system will author authorize the ticket from the proxy to the constituent API service. It'll log the authorization and it'll help route it. And there's a little sassy robot there to depict this abstract concept. Now, it turns out it's not so simple as that either, because in the previous slide, we depicted the constituent API as one shape. Uh, when I mentioned routing, you can't talk about routing without talking about something called pods. So what are pods? Pods is another abstraction we've created. And the concept of pods is it's a self-contained ecosystem that a given set of clients are said to inhabit or, or be tenants in. And this ecosystem, we have multiple of them and they share nothing. Uh, there's a little image here of like self-contained cities that that you know share nothing. The reason we do this is a couple reasons. One is sort of um, fault avoidance or or um, disaster mitigation. So if you've seen Jurassic Park, you know that when you have very complex systems, um, if you have anything, you know, even if you build something very robust and you have the best of plans, when you have very complex systems, if you have something fail, you could have catastrophic failure. And we want to be able to, to contain that in these very complex systems into a certain unit. So we divide up into some number of pods and the pods share nothing. And if for some reason you had a disaster in one pod, it would not spread to the others because they share nothing. And so we divide up our entire population of all tenants or all customers and put some of them into this pod, some of them into that pod, some of them into the other pod. And that way, you know, if one pod goes south, then the other customers are okay. Um, and obviously within pods, we have lots of redundancy, so, so that doesn't happen. The other reason we do this is because, um, you know, we create a lot of abstractions. And in theory, everything just sort of scales infinitely. We, we have load balancers. We can throw extra SQL clusters. We can throw extra web servers and anything. And when we run in clouds like Amazon or Azure, it's almost as though the computing resources are infinite. So we could sort of, in theory, scale infinitely in a single pod. However, the reality is often there are physical components that come into play and they have their own limits. And so for scalability purposes, we also want to say, look, let's not just have one load balancer that serves the entire planet, the entire population of all of our stuff. We want to carve this up. So we take those hardware resources in a set of customers, we put them in a pod, self-contained unit. I say put them in a pod. Logically, we put them in a pod um, and that way everything is independent. So these are the specific pods for Razor's Edge NXT. Um, we have basically two flavors of data centers. We have what we call colo or co-located, which are um, sort of sort of the pre-cloud era concept of a data center where we rent space there and we lease computing hardware and we're, we have a lot of responsibilities there. So uh, and Razor's Edge NXT runs in the Boston colo data center. We have two pods. Those were the two original NXTs. If you were a customer who was early onboarded in circa 2015, 2016, then you probably uh, were lit up in one of these two pods. Um, since then, we've also created pods in the Azure US data centers. So these have interesting names like S21, S41, S51. S stands for site um, because the idea is these Azure uh, pods sort of model um, the concept of a, of a classic data center site. And yes, that does mean there is an area 51 that some uh, tenants will be in. Um, there's also Azure International Data Center. So we have S22 in Western Europe, S23 in Canada, and S24 in Australia. Again, these, the, these pods share nothing. A given customer will only be in one of these pods. And that brings us to the next level of complexity. Because as soon as you have multiple pods, if I'm trying to access one customer's data, I have to have some way to look that up. So that brings us to another self-contained system or SCS, the pod lookup SCS. And what the pod lookup SCS is, is it's a database that maps customer environment ID or tenant ID. Um, you know, we use, there's a terminology we use, environment ID, which is the unique identifier for a given tenant. 
So it's a database that maps that environment ID to the specific uh, URL for the pod. I mentioned we're in lots of different data centers. All of those have different URLs, different um, routes to get to. And we have a database of what pod maps to what customer and what URL. Um, that service, like SaaS services, is accessed via REST endpoints. And because that is itself a service, in order to access it, um, it, it is authorizes its access via SAS. So what that means is when a call is made to the pod lookup, basically it evaluates a ticket coming from the SAS system, which we'll see that depicted in a moment. So um, let's look at the actual endpoint in that pod lookup service. So you can see this is a swagger page. This is from the from the actual swagger page for the pod lookup service. You can see that it has a route e one slash environments parameterized by the environment ID and also parameterized by the service type. So in our example, I have a particular environment ID. Um, I think that's the one for the Sky Developer cohort. I thought that would be a fun one to use. And then also the service type. So in our case, we're, we're calling the Blackboard API constituent service. There's lots of other services, but this is the one we're going to call in this example. And the response for this endpoint is going to be something called an audience ID, which will have a property of the uh, URL to use. Darcy. Yeah. So here's a depiction of a couple of different RE pods just to reinforce this. There's a Boston pod one, there's an S21 pod. Completely independent. Nothing is shared between those. I think we hit that point. So that means this is a little bit more accurate view. When an API call comes in, traffic manager routes to the right proxy. Proxy has to go to pod lookup. Pod lookup knows then what pod to call, and there's multiple pods. So let's watch this, and I've got a little animation to kind of show how this works. All right, let's see how this works in Teams. So the lightning bolt is going to represent sort of like electricity flowing through this system. So it goes to traffic manager, figures out which proxy it goes to North America, goes to SAS, and then it goes to SAS again, then it goes to the destination, and then it comes back. Okay. A little fast. And it feels like that little one of those little prices, right? Again, remember the guy that climbs up the hill for some reason looks like that. But um, that's a little fast. Let's watch it in slow motion. See if I can um, do the voiceover to keep time with it. So the first thing it does is, of course, we have to hit traffic manager to know which of the proxies are we going to call. So in this case, I think it's going to go to USA. And then it's going to call pod lookup. So it calls SAS to get a ticket to call pod lookup. So it calls pod lookup. Then it knows what to do. So it calls SAS to call the constituent API, which is down in this pod down here. And then the call goes back. Right? So why do we visit SAS twice? We visited SAS twice because two services were accessed, both pod lookup and the constituent API. And of course, a lot of this stuff is cached. So um, this isn't going to happen on, on every call, but on a cold call, if, if the entire internet had just restarted, um, basically all those things would have happened. Okay. Pause and catch our breath. Just a reminder, all that stuff I just went over is kind of irrelevant. You don't need to know it. Um, in the same way that a, uh, a, a baseball pitcher does not need to know con and physics to be able to throw a curveball, right? Um, Baseball pitcher probably doesn't even need to know classical physics or Newtonian physics or whatever. Um, you know, throw the ball this way, batter swings at it, hopefully he misses his own pitcher. Um, however, if there's a scientist out there, probably would tell you, well, it's because the Bernoulli effect is why it spins and blah, blah, and the molecules and all these things. You don't need to know that. So in the same way, if you're going to use Sky API, you don't need to know all the complexity that just went over or the complexity we're about to get into. This can be your mental model, and this works. So once again, if you want to change the channel here and, and be at peace with this simple view, please move on. Um, but if you want to stick with it, we're going to go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. OK, so let's just review. This is the more complex view. We've got a lot of moving parts here. We've got Azure Proxy, Traffic Manager, Pod Lookup, SAS, multiple pods. And this brings us to our next character, the Web Application Firewall, or WAP. So this is fairly standard in the industry um, to just put a guardian in front of all of the traffic coming in from the Wild West Internet. So web application firewall is something that we deploy enterprise wide, not just in RENXD, not just in Sky API, across all of our services. And it basically is a security layer. And what it does, it does 
handful of things. It, it can do a lot of things, but the biggest things it does is block known bad IP addresses. So there are known, you know, compromised machines out there, um, possibly belonging to rogue state actors, but sometimes reporting uh, belonging to criminals, um, oftentimes because they've been infected with malware and they've been, you know, um, taken over to do, to do bad things. Well, our vendor and other vendors keep track of those bad IP uh, addresses and uh, the, the WAF can block those right at the gate. Um, the other thing it does for, for traffic that it, it assumes is okay, uh, it doesn't assume anything. It actually inspects that and looks for known bad attacks. So there's a classical um, hack that people try to do called SQL injection, where they try to submit content and, and you know, stick SQL statements into headers and query strings and things like that to try and get at the data even though they're not authorized. And the WAF knows those patterns, knows about those, and can re re reject those. And there's a whole class of known exploits and known popular hacks that the WAF protects against. So if we depict this guy in the mix now, we have to overlay him over everything. So he's actually in between Azure and all this stuff. Now, we, we think Azure's probably a, uh, a good citizen. However, um, some of these endpoints are on the internet, and so we need the WAF to protect against things that are coming in from many places. Now, it turns out that uh, even the WAF is kind of complex. It's not just one thing, um, because all of this ecosystem is made up from a lot of different tech stacks. And so it turns out that those SaaS and pod lookup things, those are services that are built on our what we call our engineering system. And those are de deployed into an Azure Kubernetes service or AKS cluster, an Azure data center. And those actually run in Linux containers. And the way the WAF is implemented there is it actually runs within the container itself. I'll contrast that with the RENXD services. Those are protected by the same WAF, same set of rules and everything. But the way it's deployed is separately. Uh, we actually use a cloud deployment of the WAF. So, Logically one WAF, logically one set of rules, deployed in different ways depending on the tech stack. And those Registered Edge machines are of course deployed on classic Windows virtual machines um, running in Azure Infrastructure as a Service or in our classic Colo. Um, and so those don't really um, support the container in the same way that our engineering system does. That's why there's a difference. Okay, so, so far all that stuff looked at has been outside the pod. But of course, the pod itself is a very complex system with lots going on. And so the next thing we're going to do on this journey is drill in and zoom into one particular pod and see all the, the rich ecosystem that's in there. So just a reminder, the, the pod is a uh, self-contained system of systems. Uh, it shares nothing with other pods, and it contains web servers, database clusters, load balancers, storage, and within a single pod, there will be a specific set of RENXD tenants, aka environments, uh, within that pod. So that might look something like this. Multiple services and the database, all within a single pod. Um, you may have heard that we use a microservices architecture. So what that means is we carve up basically all the functionality um, within the application into discrete components that sort of discrete domains that have some coherence with each other. So there's actually separate services for the gift API distinct from the constituent API. There's separate services for the events API, for the constituent API. We also have a few other services that you'll see in here, the constituent data service and the gift data service that are exclusively focused on data access, not on broader API access. We have a service called the document data service that handles if you upload attachments. And then there's something called the tenant mapping services. And this is just a small sampling depict here. In reality, we actually have dozens, if not hundreds of microservices that make up the RENXD ecosystem all within the pod. If you think about it, that creates a challenge for us because when we go to deploy, we need to deploy all these services across different pods. I think I listed out six, seven, eight pods. Um, and so we, for example, we update the constituent API, we've got to deploy that to all those pods. So of course we have automation that helps us with that. And we have something called continuous delivery, meaning um, we can deploy that in a very rapid way and the services and changes in constituent API do not depend on any changes in the other stuff. They completely independent the components. Let's take a look at a real world view of that. So if you think about it, we've got multiple pods, 
multiple services, you can imagine a matrix where you would say within every pod, you know, list your list columns for each pod, list rows for every service, and then what services deployed on what pod. And we actually have tooling that helps us manage all that. And I took a screenshot of our internal tooling. This is something called Service Delivery Manager. It's an internal tool, and it basically has the entire database of what services go to what pods. You can see a few interesting things here. One, there's a yellow icon. Some of these pods are lighting up the warning. Um, probably, and I can't scroll and see all the things on the screen here, but probably one of these services has reported some sort of intermittent transient warning, and so there's a warning status here. Typically, warning means it doesn't require immediate attention. It's just an FYI. Um, if it had been an alert, if it had been a red stop sign icon, then uh, the teams that own the service or the, or the teams that own the pod manage those would also be alerted. There's a couple of cells in here that say not configured, so there are a few services that only live in certain pods and not others. Pretty rare, but there are a few. And down here on the bottom left, you can see the constituent API service. That's the one we're, talk what we're talking about today. And the good news is it's all green, and the also good news is across every pod, the same version is deployed. So our continuous delivery has worked. Uh, the, the latest bits are deployed across all the pods. I just point this out to show the complexity that we're dealing with here. It's sort of like an end times in issue because we have multiple services, multiple pods. And of course, we wouldn't be able to manage any of this without tons of automation uh, and tons of internal tooling that supports this. OK, so now we're remember we're inside the pod, so we've we've routed, you know, we've done all that stuff outside proxy up through the WAF and everything. Now our traffic is hitting the pod. And you can imagine this is this is sort of a simple view of how it looks. So in what's called the DMZ from the Internet is the constituent API service. That service itself doesn't directly talk to the database. Instead, it turns around and calls something called the constituent data service. And then the constituent data service does talk to the database using TDS SQL pro protocol. So that data service is on an internal subnet. It's actually not accessible at all from the internet. It's only accessible from the DMZ. And we have very elaborate network security groups and firewall rules and all those things in place to control that this subnet can only be accessed from this subnet and so forth. Um, we have to keep track of that stuff for compliance. It's a good best practice. And it's sort of like a, a classical way that, um, you know, segmenting data access layers has been done in IT infrastructure. So what this means, though, is that um, there's some additional complexity because the constituent data service itself, as I said, um, uh, needs to know that the caller who's calling this and the BlackBot ID token embedded into the um, authorization header actually has access to or appropriate access to do the operation that's requested. So imagine you're doing a lookup of a constituent. Well, do you have rights to view constituents? We need to know that. And so the constituent data service is going to turn around and talk to another microservice called the security authorization service. Now, this is different from the, the SaaS service we talked about before. This is an internal intrapod service called the security authorization service. And this one is specific to RENXT, and it understands the RENXT permission model. And so the constituent data service is going to turn around and call it. The security authorization service is going to make a call to the database to evaluate the user permissions that are defined in the database, and then tell constituent data service either yay or nay, is this allowed? So let's trace this. Okay. Pretty quick again, right? So the electricity flowed from the data service to the security authorization service, which hit the database, got an answer, flowed back up to the constituent data service, which then turned around and called it. Um, but it turns out this is even still a little bit too simplified a view because of course, you know, we depicted that as one shape, one cylinder, the database. But in reality, we don't just run one database. We are a highly multi-tenant system. We have, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of customers. And within our data centers, we deploy those onto SQL clusters, which are not just a single server, but redundant, fully redundant servers. Um, and these redundant servers, there's always a primary and secondary. We do this for high availability and disaster recovery. And they're highly multi-tenant. So on a given cluster, we may put something like 200 tenants on it. Um, and they use solid state disks, so they're very high performance, very expensive. <laughs> but you know, we try to get economies of scale by loading up as many tenants as we can on, onto them. Um, and we're always trying to evaluate and, and balance those out. 
But it turns out there's multiple SQL clusters per pod because, as I said, we only put around 200 tenants on a given SQL cluster. Well, some of our pods have thousands of tenants. And so you can imagine we then must have, you know, tens of clusters per pod. So multiple tenants on a cluster, multiple clusters in a pod. That's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff on the shelves. So we need help. How do the services know what is the right cluster to call? What is the right SQL connection string, if you will? Um, well, that's where something called the tenant mapping service kicks in. So the tenant mapping service is responsible within the pod of our NST of keeping track of what SQL cluster each tenant in the pod is on. So for example, um, there's a there's a database entry with for the Sky Developer cohort, happens to be in the S21 pod. In the S21 pod, the tenant mapping service has an entry that says that environment ID for the Sky Developer cohort corresponds to this SQL cluster using a connection string. Um, and that database is only within that pod. That database doesn't have any entries from any of the other pods because, as I said, they share nothing. Um, so that's good. It means that database isn't doesn't have the full body of all things. It remains small and is very efficient because we're going to be using it to look it up. OK, so now we can add this complexity in the picture. And again, we've already run through all the Azure proxy. Now we're, we're in the pod and let's watch the electricity flow in here. So. Electricity goes to the data service, goes to the service, goes to the mapping, goes to the Okay, well, that's, I'm a little dizzy. It's a little quick. Let's see if we can do that in slow motion. So, the electricity goes to the constituent data service first. The constituent data service is going to call the security authorization service. Security authorization calls tenant mapping to know which database to use. Then it finds the database, calls the database, then it comes back to security authorization, then it goes to sister data, then it has to call tenant mapping to know which database for the data it wanted in the first place. And then it turns around and calls the database and then it all flows back. Now, of course, just like with everything else, a lot of this stuff is highly cached. Um, and so not every call is going to be, you know, have all those endpoints. If you called it, you know, five milliseconds later, you're going to go straight from the constituent data service to the database because it will have already cached what the permissions are, it's the same user ID, and it will already know what the tenant mapping is. But in a worst case scenario on warm startup and all this stuff is, you know, reboots, you know, if the internet rebooted someday uh, and everything's been flushed from the cache, then that's, you know, the kind of thing you see. And that points out again why pods are good because we do rely a lot on caches. And if everything was, you know, if the whole universe of all things across all pods was in one cache, then you would start to hit the limits of what you could cache in memory. Whereas by buying it by pods, there's a finite set of things that need to be cached. Okay, so that's the that's the full story. I mean, that's what happens from the outside the pod, from within inside the pod. A lot of moving parts, a lot of moving things. Um, I just reiterate, you don't need to understand any of that stuff. Um, that's interesting. Um, it's maybe informative, but if your mental model is you have a URL and you use your favorite REST client, your favorite HTTP client, and you make a call to the API and you get the data back, that's perfect. So you can really choose the mental model you want. Do you want to have a simple view of, of how it works, the outward observable you know, system and how it works? This is perfect. You need to know nothing else. But if you sat through this talk now, you might have an appreciation behind the scenes of what happens and, and how it's made. And, and you see that actually there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of complexity. I'll just reiterate for the purposes of time, probably only scratch the surface on much of the complexity here. Each one of these characters that we took a small look at itself could probably have an hour or two hour talk drilling into all the, the nuances and details of how those things are actually, actually implemented. Again, it's the beauty of software abstraction is what I love about software is we create these abstractions to make the world simple. Um, many of the abstractions we create are sort of industry standard um, and we take inspiration from other you know, cloud SaaS providers and other leaders in the industry. In some cases, we make up our own concepts uh, for our own purposes. Um, very complex machine, but at the end of the day, it's just a simple model. So that concludes the presentation and thank you for attending and please be sure to give feedback if you found this interesting and informative and you think this sort of uh, content that's completely an FYI isn't a how to isn't a best practice or anything like that. It's just completely edutainment. Um, if you like that, uh, please give feedback and if you don't, please give feedback about that as well. Thank you.
Okay, that's it. That's all I've got. Yeah, I think you've got a few minutes. If there are any questions in the chat, my my brain is just a little bit broken there, right? Yeah. Sure. Oh. Well, I'll point out Alex Wong asked, is Rods in the pod? So, um, Alex, we must have shared at some point, there's a component that we didn't talk about today called Rods. It stands for Read Optimized Data Store. Um, and that itself is a complex system that involves a dedicated SQL cluster, something called SSIS and, a, and an ETL process um, service bus. There's lots of moving parts, and that's a component that powers the list feature. So if you go build a constituent list or a gift list, inside of RENXD, then it's powered by this read and optimized data store. And that itself is something that's in the pod. Um, and so uh, no no two pods share any rods. Even I'm starting to sound like Dr. Seuss now, but um, <laughs> and Alex asked, will the list V2 being introduced, how's that going to change this up? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. So the um, so outwardly observable, nothing will change unless we mess up. Um, so you won't know that anything changes. Under the hood, we are migrating some of the implementation um, to, I talked about those engineering system services that run in AKS. So um, some of the, the read optimized data store will be migrating to one of those engineering systems. So it'll actually move outside of this pod into a completely different uh, concept of pod we have for our modern services. Um, so it will change and evolve over time. And again, the nice thing about all these abstractions is nothing, you know, if we do it right and we make no mistakes and have no bugs, nothing outwardly observable will be noticeable when we make those implementation detail changes. I see um, Dave has a question about um, on-premise Sky API. Yeah, I'm involved in that as well. So that's that's specific to BlockBot CRM. So BlockBot CRM is a product that we do have on-premise customers who run. When I say on-premise, I mean they actually run the CRM instance at their site um and so that does create um there's there's some some differences in the tail end of this architecture but if you want to map that to this talk really each individual crm instance you can think of as a pod as its own pod it'll, it'll be a pod with one tenant you know your crm instance and so a lot of this same infrastructure will be at play and all those things so basically that that first part of the talk where we talk about pod lookup We'll have a database and we'll know the URL to your um, CRM instance. Now you'll, you'll have to opt in and decide that you want to support this and you'll have to make sure your firewalls are open um, you know, to our proxy so that we can get through to you. Uh, if you have a WAF, for example, which you probably should, um, you'd have to make sure that's accessible. But if you opt into all that configuration, then in the same way, we'll be able to route um, to your CRM instance the same way that we route to an NXT pod. And as I described, our NXT runs on Windows virtual machines. Um, so obviously CRM runs on a, you know, a Windows machine as well. And um, so that's how we'll be doing that. Good question. And I think that is it for us. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much, Paul. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Please give feedback. Please let us know if this was useful and informative.